Brilliant. Good morning, Nick, and welcome to AI TV for the NHS AI Lab Virtual Hub. Um, I'm delighted to have you. This is Nick. Nick is the Director of Applied Digital Healthcare at University Hospitals Birmingham. So morning, Nick. How are you doing today? Morning. I'm very well, thank you. Very well. Good, good. So we're just going to cover a few things about your incredible journey to where you are today. Um, from what I understand, Nick, you, you're new to health or relatively new to health, but you've had some really amazing, uh, what should we say, career pathway to get you here. Can you give us a bit of an overview of how you got to this pretty fantastic job that you're in today? Yeah, it's um, perhaps not unique, but an unusual route, I think, into working in the NHS. So I'm an engineer um, by training. I'm not clinical. Uh, I started my career working in Formula One, of all places. So I worked for McLaren. Um, for, for a few years, back in the days when um, McLaren were the only team on the grid to have a um, simulator. Um, so this is a giant computer game, in essence, where the drivers would come in and um, prepare for the races in the upcoming uh, weeks. They would also do some fairly weird and wacky tests of the cars for next year or the year after, do all the kind of conceptual design yeah. work that would cost you millions of pounds and take you um, years to do in reality, and you can do it at the click of a button. So that gave me a pretty good foundation, I think, in an understanding of what technology can do and, more importantly, perhaps what it can't do. Mm -hmm. um, I then moved to a company called Newton, worked there for 11 years, ran their healthcare practice. We grew the company from 23 people when I joined and there were 350 when I left. So very um, felt like a radically different place during, during that time. Um, but that's where I really fell in love with healthcare and, and got the bug. Um, so my, my first piece of healthcare work was at New Cross Hospital in Wolverhampton. Yeah. Uh, spent a couple of years in industry at, at Newton um, and then um, really have never left. So so worked in Wolverhampton across m many parts of uh, the NHS in and around Birmingham and the West Midlands. All of our work was on implementation of new care models, new care pathways, new ways of doing things, all to improve outcomes for patients, flow, productivity and the like. And um, University Hospitals Birmingham was a client on and off for six or seven years. And so and I, so I got to know the team here pretty well. And um, yeah. I joined in January of 2020. Great. And can you describe a little bit about what your day-to-day -day role is and what you're doing and maybe an example of one of the projects that you're working on currently? Yeah, so I describe my job really as taking the amazing innovations that are coming down the research and development track um, and as they're heading towards getting a CE mark, maybe um, building up some sort um, of, you know, some level of clinical validation and clinical data. My job is then to drag those technologies kind of kicking and screaming um, into the real world and, and into practice. So um, I, I spend most of my time with our frontline clinical teams. Yeah. Um, and this is where I draw in my experience from Newton and the kind of change management and the behavioral science behind change. Um, to then kind of wade through the really minute details that is, in my experience, absolutely required to actually put things into practice. You know, there's amazing work and it's you know, absolutely essential around mm -hmm. research and development end. But there is a science, in my view, around implementation um, and an awful lot of hard yards to be, um, to be worked through. So, so that's my job, kind of to sit between the inter at the interface between technical teams and clinical teams. And whilst I am not a coder, you know, I've done that a bit in my past, but I like to think I can talk that language. Um, and again, I'm definitely not clinical, but again, I like to think I've spent enough time at the front line in scrubs and theatres and outpatient um, departments on the road with district nurses, out with care workers, to feel like I have a bit of an understanding of what life looks like and feels like for those teams. Um, and again, so I hope I can talk their language, so it's kind of sit between, between those two teams. And... Um, yeah, I mean, since I joined in 2020, we've managed to bring in some really, I think, some really exciting innovations for the benefit of our of our patients. Um, and um, yeah, we, we've set up a, a program covering three areas. So, yeah. um, excuse the cheesy words; they all start with the word "smart." Um, it wasn't my my choice, <laughs> but I think it's a reasonable description. So, we have a program around called "Smart Access," right? So how our patients access uh, the care services across the whole of Birmingham and Solihull. We have a program around diagnostics called Smart Diagnostics, funnily enough. Um, this is bringing um, telemedicine and AI into, into practice, particularly with, in relation to imaging. And then the last one is called Smart Support, um, which is supporting patients with living with long-term conditions on long-term follow-up pathways and how we help to promote independence, self-care, 
um, and um, early wherever we can to avoid late, um, unnecess potentially unnecessary or avoidable exacerbation um, and, and therefore admission into hospital. And we've got 10 projects beneath those, which I can talk about in a, in a bit, but hopefully that gives you a flavour of the, the kind of work that's ongoing. And um, I'm working in partnership with some amazing clinicians who lead those three programmes. Yeah, that's really interesting, isn't it? And I love the fact that it's it's divided with a patient at the centre of care, but also around that kind of diagnostics and and, um, and access. Um, you talk about you've you know you're equally comfortable being a coder, although you don't do that very much these days, and being in the front line. And quite often, what we've seen is when we get uh, new innovations, people get very excited initially about oh, I don't know, a very cool diagnostic device or building that model that's going to then you know, read an image or, or something along those lines. And what we found, um, particularly with the AI award and sort of supporting some clinicians and innovators is actually, as you said, like really getting to the nitty gritty of deployment and that next step to making it real in the front line. So do you have any nuggets or, or tips or advice or kind of approaches that you could share maybe from your past or, or what you've been doing today to really kind of help just shift that needle for, for some of our colleagues who quite often listen to this programme. With, that, with the risk of stating the obvious, I guess the, the one observation I've had from speaking to colleagues you know, up and down the country working on similar themes is have absolute clarity of what problem it is you're trying to solve first. You know, this, you know I'm, I'm a geek at heart. Um, I'm not ashamed of that. Um, and, I, and I find this whole subject absolutely fascinating. And there's a million and one solutions I would love deeply love to look at and explore and understand and develop further. However, I, it's something I said in my interview with you actually for the, the role, whilst I don't want to become known as the, the no man that you know, stops mm. things going through, we have had to take quite a ruthless approach to prioritization and, and getting really crystal clear on where are the big systemic deep rooted issues where we believe we can help hundreds and thousands, ideally tens of thousands or more uh, of patients and, and staff and almost if we're not, if we don't believe we're going to be able to deliver at least double digit percentage gains for that kind of volume of patients or staff, that then frankly, you know, we'll add it to the long, long list. There's yeah. so much need and opportunity at the moment. Um, I think so. I think that ruthless prioritization is is absolutely um, key and that, that, that really crystal clear view of what it is we're trying to achieve. So that's sort of the selection of projects, first of all. And then in terms of implementation, I mean, you know, there, there are textbooks and courses you, you know, that are going to be much better at this. That, but my, my personal view is the, the more time people like us can spend at the front line, mm -hmm. building up a real understanding of what it feels like to be delivering clinical services day in, day out, and the kind of problems and challenges our clinical teams face, the better. And, it's, and I say that for two reasons. One, because I think you build up a... You know, it's all well and good looking at some data or at some evidence or some stats to tell you where the problems are. But actually, until you see it with your own eye, that, that's really the only time you can start to cut through any questions around data quality or bias or whatever it is. You know, if you, if you have that combination of hard data plus, OK, yeah, I've seen it, you can really have, take confidence in it. But then secondly, you know, frankly, I don't know how anyone could build up the empathy and the understanding of the change process you're about to embark on unless you have that meaningful one-to-one -one relationship with, with your clinical teams. Um, so that's where I spend a lot of my time. I won't pretend it's always plain sailing and straightforward. A lot of what, you know, a lot of change generally could be scary. I think you throw AI into the mix and frankly, I think it terrifies people. I don't think there's a great common understanding, perhaps not helped by the press, um, of, of AI. So for example, a very common misconception I've had to, you know, myth I've had to bust for a number of our teams is you know, how can we let this AI loose and just continue learning on the fly in our clinical environments and of course that's not the case right no. yeah, train a model but then we lock it down and then there's a very strict regulatory process around how you deploy and upgrade and improve um, but again all, all these kind of d helping to uh, uh, understand those issues and, and work through them one by one I think is best done face to face where possible or at least on a one-to-one -one basis virtually when not given COVID. That's, yeah, that's really, uh, I mean, I've, I've found the same, you know, really trying to understand, and I totally agree with you when you say that kind of problem-first approach. Quite often people get slightly swayed by 
new and innovative and shiny things when actually a problem might be slightly boring or dull but actually that is the problem that if you need to solve it and as you say double digit returns is always really helpful and you talked a little bit about your three pillars which are, are really fantastic the three smart pillars and then you said there were 10 programs underneath it could you maybe give an outline of one or two of them yeah sure um so given the subjects in the audience i'll, I'll pick on the ai projects worth saying within the 10 we have a real mix. There are some that are very techy and not, they're the ones I'll perhaps talk about today. There are others that have no technology in them whatsoever. They're purely about relationships. So for example, we have a project which is based upon developing closer relationships and you know, almost legal uh, relationships between secondary and primary care. We believe that's absolutely essential to reduce the barriers and the silos that exist that, that prevent um, some of the kind of seamless flow of patients and information through the system. So. Uh, yeah, and that, that's quite intentional that we have a mixture of, of both because I think one without the other misses a real real trick. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the projects I'll perhaps focus on, um, the first would be a skin cancer pathway we deployed in, um, we started in April of 2020. Yeah. So, so for me, being a member of the NHS as a, as a member of staff and COVID is one, one and the same thing. I joined pretty much as COVID was just becoming a thing. Um, and uh, our skin cancer team, our dermatology team, you know, we're impacted in, in much the same way as a lot of our outpatient services in that outpatients pretty much ground to a, ground to a halt. Um, and so the team had been looking at traditional kind of teledermatology models for a little while. I'd been talking to um, a couple of providers of um, skincare AI, and, and I'd always envisaged we'd kind of get to this maybe in one or two or even three years. Um, three months in, <laughs> catapulted in, so what could you do? Um, to try and provide and maintain services for our, for our patients that would have otherwise stopped. So we've we've since worked with Skin Analytics. We've had an amazing collaboration with them, say, since April of last year. And um, we've had just over 4,000 patients through that pathway um, now. This is working in collaboration with um, Ershad Zaki, who's our clinical service lead, great, yeah. great um, clinical lead and a, and a great clinical team. And during that time, we've managed to get the backlogs down from we peaked at about 750 patients, I think, on the two-week wait, um, which is you know, one of the largest services, but you know, that, that's, that's too long a list um, for fairly obvious reasons during the, the COVID pandemic. But over the course of the last almost 12 months or so now, we've got that right down to below 50, I think at 35 patients at my last count. And the best, and of course, anyone can manage capacity and demand with the traditional model, right? Um, but the best thing about the model we put in place is that during the third wave of the COVID pandemic, when our clinical teams have been redeployed into ITU or into um, delivering vaccinations or medical oversight, the pathway is kept turning because it's now delivered by medical photographers, it's delivered by healthcare assistants away from the hospital sites. And so our waiting list has actually continued to come down. Um, so it's been a, a challenging process. It's probably only half done. We've got much bigger ambitions for this. We want to get out into primary care yeah. Um, there's more work to be done on the model itself, um, but it's it's been a great. I think it's been a great success over the course of the last last year. Holds huge potential for the for the future, and most importantly, um, it, it's meant we can continue to provide services for you know, particularly melanoma, which is such an aggressive form of cancer mm -hmm. that otherwise just frankly wouldn't have been possible, um, particularly during this third wave. Yeah, that's really interesting. And you talked a little bit initially about. Um, working more closely with primary care and providers. Can you explain a bit more? Because quite often, I think innovators especially don't always understand, you know, how the complexity of the NHS works. And uh, having been a clinician for many years, we also don't understand sometimes, you know, that kind of structure of primary care, secondary care, and how it all plugs together from a commissioning perspective in particular. And um, so you talk about breaking down those barriers. Could you just explain a little bit more or maybe elaborate on that first project that you mentioned? Yeah, if I just try and share a story to try and illustrate why we believe it's important, and I'll just I'll cherry pick one um, pathway. So the breast cancer pathway, for example, this is a story that our chief exec tells fairly regularly. That um, the nice guidance is really clear for breast cancer. If you go and see your GP and you hit various different red flags, you are pretty much guaranteed to be referred into um, secondary care and go through a one-stop clinic where you have something called the triple check. Um, you know, and that, and that works. There's huge demand going through that pathway and the clinical teams do an amazing job, but it's, it's a real 
challenge. And clearly, the sooner we can get people access to specialist care, the quicker we can get a diagnosis or reassurance and, and commence treatment. Um, in that instance, where the check was to assess whether someone hit those few red flags, you know, I, I personally think we really need to challenge whether that is a, a, a valuable use of the patient's time, or actually they needed to book an appointment and then get enough, you know, when the only possible outcome was to book a further appointment in secondary care. So surely there was an opportunity to skip that step for the patient. But also from primary care's perspective, I would argue, is that really the best use of um, primary care's time, which is so critical, um, particularly when we talk about you know, the aging population, um, multiple comorbidities, you know, huge complexity. In my view, that's where we really need primary care colleagues, you know, the generalists who are absolute like gold dust in the system to be focusing their time and effort um, and not on just delivering a protocol. So by collaborating with primary care, um, we are in the process of developing, we haven't launched this yet, but we're in the process of developing a pathway whereby when the patient calls up, speaks to the reception or in, in this, probably a clinical triage actually, and, and that's mm. the first point of contact with, um, with their surgery as they would do normally, rather than them booking an appointment to see a GP, they'll ask a few basic questions and if that person hits those red flags there and then, they'll just get them booked straight in to come into secondary care for, for a single or double or a triple check, depending on, on the context of that individual. And that, in my view, is only possible if you truly collaborate with clinical teams on both sides of that one fence. Um, and of course, the challenge with health and social care is there's lots of fences between lots of professionals and between lots of organisations. And so there's many of these we need to, to tackle, primary, secondary is is one very important one but there are lots more um and so so that's the kind of rationale behind what we're doing we've we've approached this we've got some great partners in primary care that um uh, the pathfinder group that uh, cover about almost a quarter of a million um of our local population we, yeah. we serve 1.25 million so it's about a fifth of um of our population and we are kind of pioneering and developing these pathways in collaboration with them but our ambition is to roll it out across the whole of Roll these new pathways out across the whole of Birmingham and Solihull, frankly, as quickly as we possibly can. Yeah. But by having, you know, a small group of people, we can, not a small, uh, you know, a meaningful sort of group of people that we can pioneer these things with, um, we believe will get us to rolling this out across the whole, the whole system um, e even quicker. Yeah, well, that's great. That's really good. So maybe sort of to finish up, um, you talk about rolling these out uh, across a larger population. People often ask me, you know, where do you see us? Where do you see uh, healthcare in ten years' time? And I always think that's a really ambitious timeline. So maybe roll it back a bit. Say three years from three years today, considering you know the time we've been through over the last eighteen months. Where's, what's your hope? What's your dream that um, with some of these programs and projects? Oh, my. My expectation, I guess, my ambition for, for three years within Birmingham and Solihull is that we have really cemented that, particularly the primary secondary care relationship. And so we have deployed you know, 20, 30, 40 integrated care pathways where patients can ask a question, because I think that's most of the time that's, that's where some, you know, a care pathway starts, right? I'm worried about something or I'm concerned about something or I need some information. Yeah. They can ask a question and they can immediately get rooted based on some predefined protocols or rules into the most appropriate part of the system. And that may be their GP, it may be a diagnostic centre, it may be straight to specialist, you know, depending on the context of that individual and that, that condition. And then for when we get into those centres, to be using the latest technology to, frankly, minimise the variation in decision making. Yeah to um, have a constant quality. That's where I think the human plus AI combination comes in really well, because you have the kind of nuance and the detail of the human plus the AI, which brings that constant quality factor. And then using technology to be as productive as possible. So for example, we've set up a whole load of asynchronous pathways now where you know, patients come in for their diagnostic and then that diagnostic information is reviewed that evening or the day after, you know, after the event by a clinical team. They use that information to risk stratify and then decide what next for the patient. Um, so, yeah, I, I hope it will be considerably more straightforward for patients. We will be able to communicate more clearly with them, get better outcomes, and and make more efficient use of our, you know, really precious resources across the across the care system. 
That's great. Thanks, Nick. And last question from me before we wrap up. Um, you've obviously had a really exciting journey um, in your career. If you had to share kind of one nugget or one piece of advice to our listeners, what would that be to, to kind of say, look, here's a, a path to success? Oh, it's really cheesy, isn't it? And it's a huge cliche, but, you know, coming back to my other point I made earlier, just have absolute clarity of how, how we're helping our patients and our, and our staff. Um, you know, it's, it's much overquoted, I think, you know, put the patient at the centre. I, I sort of cringe slightly when I hear people saying it. Um, but it's so true. It's so true. If we can promote independence, health, well-being, avoid ill health in the first place, then you know, the rest kind of looks after it itself. So despite how, how much of a cliche that is, um, how tired we become of hearing it, I think it's absolutely essential to remain at the focal point of everything we do. Brilliant. Well, Nick, thank you so much for spending some time with us today and good luck with all the programmes in uh, in Birmingham. They sound really amazing and have a great day. Cheers.